This sermon was downloaded from spiritnerds.org. We equip Christians with thousands of strategic spiritual materials daily. Join millions of Christians around the world who have come to Spirit Nerds to learn about God and His Word today. Let us um, rise to feet as we welcome Pastor Lori Idahosa. Vic. I'm happy to finally be here. Thank you, Pastor Poju. Thank you, Pastor. And I'm honored with this opportunity to serve you with the gospel. Amen. Amen. And I'm excited about the theme of this year's Wavek. I really believe that last year would just, just was not it for me. This was the one I was supposed to be at. So I'm excited about serving in this one. And I'm excited about each and every one of you. Let's lift our hands to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Mole viri anda la bossi kili anda lo boko raba kasi katare beke she se ti ata lo boko sokoro boko shi. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the entrance of your word that brings light. It brings life. Thank you, Jesus, for your word that quickens our mortal bodies, for your word that brings alive the dream and the vision that you brought us to this earth to achieve and accomplish. Father, we thank you that your word is like the voice of many waters. It washes away every obstacle. It washes away every device. It washes away every situation and circumstance that would try to stand between us and the destination that you have called us to walk in. Father, we receive the utterance of the word of God. I want you to put a demand in your spirit right now for divine utterance during this convention. During this walk back, God is going to speak to us in a big way. The word that the Lord put into my spirit to share on this morning is that God is speaking in a big way. Everybody say big way. I want you to lift your hands right now and say, Father, I receive a supernatural turnaround that comes from a direct word from you. Father, I receive direction. I receive the prophetic. I receive from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. I bring everyone greetings today from my wonderful husband. He'll be with us tomorrow. Uh, along with my three amazing children. They're all going to be uh, participating with us in this year's Wavbeck. I'm excited to have them here. And I also bring you greetings from my mother in love, Archbishop Margaret Benson Idahosa, and the entire Church of God Mission family. I spoke to Mama this morning, and she sends her greetings to everyone. Yesterday, before I left Benin, she prayed for me. So whatever, whatever you see, this is a result of Mama's prayers. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, I believe that God is speaking to us in a big way, and I just want you to write that in your notes, because that's, that's a very specific word that God gave me for this particular Wabbeck, is that, Wabbeck, is that God is speaking to us that we are going to hear from him in a big way. Now, throughout my life, I've had lots of times that God has given me very clear instructions that have shaped the entire direction of my life. When I was 11 years old, I might say 11. I don't think there's any 11-year-olds in this room. 
Maybe they're watching online. But when I was 11 years old, I came to Nigeria for the very first time. And I came as a guest of Pastor Victor Onigbo in Enugu, a wonderful man of God. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. But my father and I, we came to do some missionary work here. My mother was with us as well. And as I was in Enugu at 11, the Lord spoke to me very clearly and he said, this is your home. Now, 11 years old, you know, you can think, oh, maybe it's because she had friends or maybe it's because she was happy or maybe it was because they gave her food that she liked. Maybe it was the jollof rice. <laughs> but it wasn't any of those things. It was, it was a divine word from God. And as I was in the airplane going back home, I cried from Lagos all the way back to the U.S. And my mom kept saying, why are you crying? I said, no, mom, that's my home. And so my mom got out her Bible and she wrote down the date and she wrote down what I said and she, she was like, okay, Laurie, this is, this is obviously, a, I literally cried for the entire flight back to the U.S. as an 11-year-old. And so my mom took that word and I believe that there's people who are assigned to your life the way that my mom was assigned to my life. And my mom took that word and she held it in her heart. And everything that tried to pull me off course, my mom would go back to Nigeria as her home. Any guy that I tried to date, there is this one guy that I had a, I really liked him. Like, I really, really liked him. He was, he was a captain in the army. Actually, was he army? I'm trying to remember the, the military service he was in. But he was a captain. He was a pilot. He was just just a really cool guy and I really liked him and he was in my dad's church and I just thought you know what we just he's a cool guy and so I really was kind of progressing in a relationship with him and my mom decided against my knowledge and against my will to uh, to take him out to lunch one afternoon and, and she took him out I was in my early 20s and I thought this was gonna be it and my mom took him out to lunch and she said listen Laurie will never be satisfied if she marries you. Nigeria is her home. And the guy came back and broke up with me. <laughs> and I thought, like, my, at that point I was like angry with my mom, right? But there was a word that was setting the trajectory of my life. And every type of relationship that I tried to get into, there was always a solid thing, mm-mm. That's not going to take you to Nigeria. So then when my husband finally came and said, you know, Laurie, I think we should get married. I knew him since I was 13, but he didn't ask me until I was in my late 20s. And when he finally said, Laurie, I think we should get married, it was, it was unquestionable because I knew that that would take me to my home. Have you ever had a word from God? A word that shapes your decisions. When you have a word from God, it's supposed to shape your decisions. Right after high school, I didn't go right to the university because I knew what God was calling me to. And so after high school, I didn't go to the university like everybody else. I went to Bible school. And I did my full Bible school training. And then after Bible school, I now went to go live in Guatemala so I could train as a missionary. And then I came back to Archbishop Benson Hosa, and I said, I finished my training as a missionary. This is before I went to university. And he said, and I said, can I come work with you in Nigeria? He said, it's not your time yet. He said, you're not supposed to come here as a missionary. <laughs> and I was heartbroken, but God knew I wasn't coming as a missionary. I was coming as a wife. Missionaries come and go. Wives have roots. <laughs> so I couldn't miss my calling by stepping into something else. You know, are you, are you hearing what I'm talking about? God speaking to you in a big way. And when God speaks to you in a big way, it, there's a protection around your life. There's people he, who, who he will divinely assign to you that will be guardrails for you. Don't push away your guardrails. The vision is yet for an appointed time. At the end, it will speak. Amen? 
So I want to talk about different things that you can hear for God. Now, in the, the life of a believer, all of us are meant to be led by the Spirit of God. And I'm going to very quickly go through some ways that we're all led by the Spirit of God. Because I think we need to lay a foundation between the difference between the daily experience of a believer and the big hearing from God. Okay? There's some daily experiences that we're meant to have as believers. And one is that we hear from God through sound teaching, mentorship, and solid leadership. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 24. This isn't the big way. This is one of the ways that every one of us are meant to hear from God on a daily basis. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Now there's gifts that Christ gave to the church. There's apostles, there's prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Verse 13 is really critical. I want you to see verse 13. It says, this will continue until we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of God's son. So the apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, the fivefold ministry gifts are part of God's divine plan to help us hear from him. So this trend that we have, this global trend that we have going on right now, where people are saying, I don't really need to go to church anymore. I enjoyed the COVID season where I was home watching online and I can have my own personal study time with God and God can just speak to me. And we, we've, we've pushed aside the ministry gifts of the body of Christ. That's not God's divine order. Yes, we're meant to have personal studies time. It's important. But God uses, it says here that this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. So the ministry gifts of the church is important. The sound teaching, the mentorship, the solid leadership. It says in verse 14, it says, so that you won't be immature like children who are tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of new teaching. That we'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So sound teaching, mentorship, and solid leadership. Another way that every one of us as believers ought to be led by the Spirit of God and hear his voice it's just living a spirit-led life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 26, clearly tells us what a spirit-led life looks like. So if you don't know the pattern of a believer's life, you'll just be following teachings up and down, here and there, following patterns. But no, no, no. A spirit-led life looks like this. You should have the fruit of the spirit, the evidence of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, against there is no law. So, so all these things should look like your everyday life. Everybody say, my everyday life. It's not the wow thing from God. This is how we ought to be as believers. These are the manifestations of our relationship with God, the fruit of the Spirit. It says in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, we... We will walk in the spirit. So don't be envious or desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The scripture is just beautiful. Because everything that we need to know about our everyday walk with God is right here in the word. It also talks to us in Romans chapter 8, which we could spend days and days teaching on. It says in verse 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they're the sons of God. So you're being led by the spirit of God. How many of you are led by the spirit? It's part of our everyday walk as believers. Another thing that Apostle Arume referred to in the last session, he talked about Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. And it says, remember what it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. I want you to listen to that scripture right there in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. Today when. Everybody say today. When. 
So when you wake up in the morning, right? Today, when I get out of bed. Today, when I check my phone. Today, when I have breakfast, right? Because these are things that you're expected to do. Today, when I get to work, we'll finish the conversation. The today when is something all of us say on an everyday basis, right? Today when I get there, today when we have dinner, today when I call you, today when should be an everyday thing. So hearing from God should be one of those today whens. Today when I hear his voice. How many of you have a daily experience of hearing the voice of God? It's not meant to be a conference thing. It's not meant to be a Sunday morning thing. It's meant to be a today when thing. Everybody say today when. So there should be a daily communication between you and God. He also guides us gently when we hear his voice. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12, Elijah heard God in a still small voice. In John chapter 10, verses 4 to 5, a scripture that we're all familiar with, it talks about my sheep hear my voice and they know me, they follow me. The voice of a stranger they won't follow. So it should be common that we follow him the way a sheep would follow the shepherd. So everybody say everyday life of the believer. All right, God speaks to the believers in an everyday life through his word. He can't speak to us through his word if we don't read the word. Because if you don't know the word, you'll be like those children that we read in the earlier scripture that are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Somebody comes and preaches that, uh, that you have to pray this certain kind of prayer to get this certain kind of miracle and they take a scripture out of context and they preach this scripture out of context and you take it as doctrine and then you start trying to pray this certain type of prayer to get this kind of miracle and you forget that the God of miracles lives on the inside of you and he just wants to manifest himself through you and you don't have to call down this certain type of thing because you know who you are in Christ Jesus. The more you know the word, the more that you act on the word, the more that the word becomes your everyday experience. God speaks to us through his word. Psalm 119, scripture we're all familiar with, 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word is the thing that illuminates our pathway. Everybody say everyday experience for believers. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, in the ESV version, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable. So what's the scripture supposed to do for us? It's supposed to teach us. It says it's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof, for correction. None of us like that word. We prefer the training in righteousness. Yes, the scripture is training the unrighteousness. But we forget that the scripture is also meant to correct us. So as we're hearing the word and studying the word and developing ourselves in our everyday life, we should see course corrections happening regularly. We should regularly say, ooh, ooh, that relationship is not profitable. I need to reduce my amount of time with that person. Uh-oh, that business venture it has some shady things going on. God's going to teach me to profit. He's not going to do it through unhealthy and unwholesome means. The more you have the word, the more the word corrects your behavior. And in James chapter 1 verse 22, we're all familiar with it. It says in NIV version, it says, don't merely listen to the word so you deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Isn't it simple? Everyday life. Everybody say everyday life. This is what we should be experiencing. It says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Everybody say richly. So you're not supposed to have a small measure of the word. You're meant to have a deep level of the word. So every situation and circumstance that comes up your way, you have an answer for it according to the word of God. You know, right now it's really trending to, uh, to go for counseling or to go for therapy, right? 
It's kind of like everybody's talking about therapy nowadays. Okay, we can do therapy, but if your therapy does not align with the Word of God, where are you actually taking me to? It's very important what voices you listen to. It's very important what influences you have. And there's subtle ways that the enemy will try to come in and shift your direction and shift your focus away from the truths of God's Word. But the more that you know the truth of God's Word, you know that things like they were, they'll tell you in therapy that healing is in layers. You know, you're going to do the inner work. You'll get it over time. When the scripture tells me, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I don't have to heal in layers. God can suddenly take that old man, that old nature, that unwholesome thought process, and remove it from me and put within me the mind of Christ. The scripture tells me, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus didn't have a layered mind. He had a healed, wholesome mind that was clear. And I can let that mind be in me because it was also in Christ Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? The word. Everybody say the word. It works. Amen? So as you're hearing from God and you're, you're walking through your everyday path, it's important that you can, are able to discern what is coming from God and what's coming from other sources. And the only way that you can, can, can discern that is being very comfortable and very used to being around the authentic. Okay, we've all heard uh, the story about bankers, right? And when bankers are trying to learn the difference between counterfeit currency and real currency, they don't give them a lot of counterfeit to look at. They give them a lot of real currency. They feel it, they touch it, they count it. They smell it, they, they look at it, they know everything about the real. So that when the counterfeit comes, it's foreign to them. A lot of us are spending a lot of time learning about the counterfeits. That we're more comfortable with the counterfeits than we are with the real. We're spending more time on our social media looking at bloggers. And people who put pictures of themselves that are indecent. That when we actually see something that's wholesome, it looks weird. Forgetting that we're supposed to spend more time with the wholesome so that the counterfeit looks weird. What do you meditate on? What do you think about? James chapter 3 tells us that the wisdom... This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where there's envying and strife, there's confusion in every evil work. We have to avoid those types of environments. But in verse 17 of James chapter 3, it says, But the wisdom that is from above, things that are coming from God, things that we ought to meditate on, things that we ought to digest and ingest on a regular basis, the wisdom that's from above is what? It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's easy to be entreated. It's full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of times we get confused by that and we say, Oh, if the wisdom that comes from God is peaceable, then whenever there's a storm, it means it can't come from God. But the more that you know the word, the more that you know that God operates in the storm. And God uses adverse situations. God uses adversity for our good. So we can't say because there's a challenge. I love Pastor Poju for saying that last night. Where wherever there's a challenge, a lot of people say, oh, 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 that can't be God. But God is in the midst of the storm. I want you to say this after me. Say, God is in the midst of the storm. Just because something comes from God does not mean that it will be easier without opposition. It's peaceful, but peace does not mean the absence of the storm. If you remember in Mark chapter 4, when Jesus spoke to the storm, so the waves were rushing and every, the disciples were in the ship and all this stuff was happening, right? And Jesus was asleep. 
And they're like, Master, Master, aren't you worried that we're, that this thing is going crazy? And Jesus just stands up and he's like, why are you worried? Peace be still. That's the kind of God that we should serve. That's the kind of lifestyle we should have every day as believers. That when the storm is raging, when the diagnosis is given, storms rage in different ways. When the girlfriend breaks up with you, when you don't pass the exam, when you don't get the house, when you don't get the promotion, when you lose somebody that you love, you can speak to that storm and say, peace be still. Because the Spirit of God is on the inside of you. Say, everyday experience for the believers. So how do I know that I'm hearing from God? I'm just laying a foundation very quickly. How do I know that I'm hearing from God? If I'm hearing from God, everything that I'm hearing will align with his word. And it won't contradict itself. So I should be able to hear from God and say, this thing lines up with God's word. Everything that God speaks to us will also require your faith. Everybody say faith. God doesn't speak something to you that doesn't require you to believe. He doesn't give you things that are naturally attainable. He gives you things that require his presence. God also gives directives, and I want to be very clear with that. God doesn't give us multiple choice. You can do A, B, C, or D. If you look all through the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there was never a time when the prophets or the apostles or the disciples or Jesus or any of the characters in the Bible, there was never a time where, where they said, okay, you know, Noah, you can build an ark or you can do this. Mary, you can accept Jesus into your womb or you can just go about and marry Joseph. He doesn't give you options. Everybody say, no option. Now, the interesting thing is, is he doesn't give us a list of options, but we do have the choice to obey or not to obey. And there's consequences for both. So now we're going to talk about hearing from God in a big way. I think we laid the foundation of our everyday hearing from God. So let's talk about hearing from God in a big way. Noah had to build the ark in Genesis chapter 6. When the Lord spoke to Noah to build the ark, it was a directive. And it was very uncomfortable. Some of the directives that God's going to give you in this season are going to be uncomfortable. I know Apostle said in the last session we should laugh, and this is how we're going to be laughing. Some of you people will be laughing at you. Because you're going to be taking steps of faith and they'll be laughing at you. See this fool. Let's watch her fail. Have you ever had somebody say that to you? Go and try it. We'll see what happens. And they give you that eye. You know that eye. Like we already know that you can't do it. But go ahead and try. Some people will look at you like that, and if you're not strong in your daily today when I hear his voice, if you're not strong in your daily being led by the Spirit, if you're not strong in your daily ingestion of the Word, when those oppositions come your way, they can derail you. They can make you doubt yourself. And they can make you eventually walk into disobedience. Noah stayed the course. There's different theologians that say different things about how long it took to build the ark. So I don't know which house you're in. Some say it was five years. Some say it was 52 years. Somebody else said it was 120 years. I don't really care how long. It was long enough. It took him a while to build that ark. And he had to do it in the presence of his accusers. Some of you are going to hear a word from God. And you're going to have to step out in faith in the presence of your accusers. And you might feel like you're all alone. An earmark of a big way word from God. That's just how I'm describing it, a big way. So just take me as I am. An earmark of a big way word from God is that many times you feel like you're walking alone. But you're not. 
You have the backing of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and you have a body of Christ of believers who believe the same God that you believe. You just need to link up with the right people. Many of us have wrong associations that make us feel isolated. When God said, all throughout the scriptures, he talks about how it's not good for man to be alone. How can two walk together? It talks about a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. It, it talks about the importance of fellowship and the importance of comfort, of having other people around me. Do not be isolated in your walk with God. When God speaks something to you, there are destiny helpers. Now, I'm careful with that word because there's some funny teachings about that. But there are people who will help your destiny along. There are people who will stand in faith together with you. There are people who will believe alongside you and will share your same passion for what God spoke. Think about Jonah. Now, Jonah was actually one of those who was alone. <laughs> Think about Jonah. And when the Lord spoke to Jonah, a very clear instruction to go to Nineveh, right, and to warn them. Jonah decided, I told you there's a choice. You either obey or you don't obey, right? So Jonah took the other choice. And Jonah decided to disobey. So Jonah ended up on a ship heading the opposite direction. And as he was in the ship, the word that God spoke did not change. God didn't say, oh, okay, since you're headed this way, why don't you go and talk to those people instead? I mean, God could have been gracious unto him like that. But he's not. He said, God, he says, no, Jonah, I gave you an assignment. Your life is here for a reason. And so now there is waves and winds and the whole ship was tossing all around and the people on the ship were saying, what's going on? And then Jonah's like, it's me. It's because I'm here because I disobeyed. Let me be self-sacrificing and throw myself into the water. People said, no, 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 no. We won't let you do that. Then they went back and thought and were like, hmm, if it's really him, maybe we ought to get rid of this disobedient one. And they went ahead and they threw him into the water. And we know what happened. He was swallowed up by the fish. And then he ended up going back to Nineveh where God had called him to go to. And God, and he started ministering to the people and warning the people of their rebellion and their hedonistic ways. And then what did God do for the people? God saved the people. Because that's what God had intended to do all along. He wanted them to be warned so that they could be saved. But Jonah still had his own agenda. And he was angry with God because he didn't like those people that he was sent to talk to. And he thought that they should have been destroyed. Let me tell you, you cannot add anything to a word from God. When God speaks a word, that is the word. You can't add to it. You can't subtract from it. You know, I have a friend who is always asking me gist, always like, oh, what's happening with that? What's happening with that? And I'll tell them the part I know. And they'll keep asking I'm like, well, what about with it? Like, Listen, I told you everything I know. Everything else I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be making it up. But there are some people who prefer the jara. <laughs> they don't want the real thing. They want the opinion of the thing. Well, how did he look when he was saying it? Do I know? But too many of us are into that side. Listen, when God speaks, he speaks one thing. You stick to it. You obey it. And you don't have to question it and say, but God, can't you do it my way? Because his ways are perfect. The scripture tells us he knows the end from the beginning. So if he's giving you a talk, if he's giving you a word in a big way, it's because he knows the destination that you're going to. And he knows that if you take this step of obedience, it's going to take you down this pathway that will get you to the place that he's called you to be. That will get you to the destiny of why he even put you here on this earth in the first place. So don't add anything like Jonah did to what God says. Other people who experience God in a big way, I think of Paul on the road to Damascus. And we all know how uh, Saul had the experience on the road to Damascus and he was blinded and then he went somewhere. And then I think the real boss or the real hero of the story is not really Saul. Have you ever really read the story in completion? There's somebody in that story who really heard from God. Many of us talk about, oh, Saul on the road to Damascus, but we forget about Ananias. 
Do you remember the role that he had if you read it in your scripture? In Acts chapter 9, I want you to look down in Acts chapter 9, and it says in verse 9, after, he had, after Saul had his experience, which we all are familiar with, it says, and he was there three days without sight, he didn't eat or drink. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Lord, here I am. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias responded to the Lord, and, and all of us generally have this response to the Lord when he speaks to us in a big way. And Ananias responded to the Lord and he said, But Lord, I've heard about this man and how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem and how he has the authority from the chief priests to bind up all who call on your name. In other words, Lord, if I go there, I'm in trouble. This guy is bad news. This guy can kill me. This guy has the authority to destroy my life. God, why would you send me there? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. How many of us would have the courage of Ananias? Or how many of us would say, mm -mm, God, that one is too dangerous? Maybe God specifically speaks to you about a cult that you're meant to influence, or a group of people who have some tribalistic beliefs that you're meant to influence. You say, but God, these people can destroy me. These people kill people. Some people in this room are afraid of somebody who gets a little bit of powder on their hands and goes <laughs> And we start fearing that thing more than we fear God himself. And Ananias had a genuine reason to be afraid. Because Saul, Saul had the authority to bind up the believers, to kill them. But it says here, it says here in verse 16, it says, For I will show him many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, and he entered into the house, and he laid hands on him, saying, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That took courage for him to take that step. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Imagine being Ananias in that story. All the processes he had to go through because God needed somebody who would be obedient. Are you that somebody who will be obedient to God when he speaks to you in a big way? Will you be obedient? Will you, will you hear his voice and say, yes, Lord? And we know exactly all that happened with, with Saul and how he preached Christ Paul. And we know, we know everything about that story from there forward. But I want us to remember the person who heard from God in the middle of it in a big way. Think about Zechariah. I'm sharing some stories from the Bible this morning because I think it's important for us to get the basis that hearing from God in a big way is meant to be our experience as believers. We know when Zechariah was told that his wife Elizabeth was with child, we know that he was confused and he questioned God and God had to shut up his mouth and make him dumb and keep him until the baby was full, uh, fully mature in the womb. Amazing. Because he didn't want to act on his area of obedience that he should have acted on. But then there's a different person in that same story of Zechariah. And Elizabeth, and her name is Mary. How many of you know Mary? We just had Christmas. How many of you know Mary? <laughs> Abby, you know Santa Claus. <laughs> All right, so there's Mary, right? And what happened with Mary? Mary says in verse 26 of Luke chapter, of Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, 
And it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee and named Nazareth, to a virgin exposed to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel of the Lord came to her, everybody say, in a big way. And he said, Hail thou art highly favored, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. And she saw him and she was troubled at his saying. And she cast in her mind, what kind of greeting is this? What kind of salutation is this? And the angel of the Lord said to her, said, fear not Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and his name shall be called Jesus. And he will be great and he'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And as of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel. Everybody say, then she said to the angel. How? When God speaks to you something in a big way, many of us are still going to respond, How? But just because Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I haven't known a man, it didn't stop the process of the miraculous that God was going to do in her life. Many of us think that asking God how is going to limit his power. No, when God speaks to you something in a big way, it's okay to say, God, how are you going to do it? And that's what Mary said to the angel, how? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And it's going to be a holy thing. And it's going to be called, it's going to be called the Son of God. Then he told her about Elizabeth. Then in verse 38, Mary said to him, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. When was the last time you heard a word from God that you responded with, be it unto me according to your word? Oftentimes it doesn't speak to us about the high levels of promotion. He speaks to us about the areas of assignment. Because he knows that those assignments, whether they're beautiful or not, they're leading us somewhere. And if we're not obedient to the big words from God, if we're not obedient to the divine direction of God, we don't get to the destination he's called us to get to. I mentioned my father-in-law earlier in the, the topic as I've been sharing. And there was a time that he came to speak at my father's church in, in Delaware in the U.S. And I was a teenager. I was 16 at the time. And I was still in high school. But my parents raised us that we work. So... I got my first job when I was 14 years old. I was still going to school, but I was working at 14. I was, my first job, I was a cleaner in the church. So I was cleaning toilets, I was cleaning the chairs, washing the floors, doing the cleaning job of the church at 14 as the pastor's child. Not sitting on the front row. <laughs> yes, carry my bag. <laughs> no, I was the toilet cleaner of the church. That was my first job. If you've never cleaned toilets in a church, I don't know how you can hold this microphone. Because you have to know how to serve people and not be served. So my first job was as a cleaner in my father's church. The second job I had was as a waitress in a restaurant. And I was earning $2.13 an hour, plus tips, which were about $20 a day. And the archbishop, and I was going to school. So my parents didn't like drive me from school to go and work. Hope you know. <laughs> but so Archbishop Bensonita Hosa came to my father's church and he preached a beautiful message I don't remember what it was but it had to have been beautiful and uh, but I remember this one part of it where at the end he took an offering and he said that he was raising money to put roofs on churches and the thing just bubbled up on the inside of me and he said I want However many people, you know, that was the time of like, I need 100 people to do this and 10,000 people to do that and whatever. He called out a number of people to give $1,000 towards putting roofs on churches. Now, my parents didn't raise me in a way where I could come to daddy and say, daddy, I want to give $1,000 to put a roof on a church. Can I have it? My dad would just be looking at me and be like, what? <laughs> if you want to put a roof on a church, get your own money. In fact, I traveled to over 30 countries as a young adult and as a teenager 
preaching the gospel alongside my father, he never bought my airline ticket once. He said, if you want to follow me, raise your own money. So I did it. I raised my own money because I wanted to follow him. I wanted to see the miraculous. I wanted to see the blind eyes open. I wanted to experience the crusade environment. And so because I so wanted to be where God called me to be, I made the sacrifices. But in that particular moment, in that particular season, I wanted to have $1,000 to give to Archbishop Itahosa to put roofs on churches. Now this was far before I knew he was going to be my father-in-law. And so I had one week. He said, by next Sunday, bring it. Now, I don't know where a 16-year-old is going to get $1,000 in one week, even today. And this is going back, I don't want to say how many, like decades, three, maybe? Three decades and two years. So I went to work and I started to pray in the spirit. And I said, God, I committed something. I said that I'm going to give $1,000 by next Sunday. And so as I was waiting tables, I kept praying in the spirit. I said, Father, this must be the way that the resources are going to come to me. And so I was super friendly to every table I went to. Hi, how are you? Can I get you anything? Do you need more water? Oh, no, no, let me get you some extra of that. Da, 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 da. And there was the first table that I went to. Their ticket came to $20, their bill. So my tip should have been like $2, right? 10%. It's 20 if they're really generous, but people weren't that generous. <laughs> Two dollars should have been my tip. They paid their $20 bill. They left me a hundred dollar bill on the table. I said, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. When you have a vision, when you have a destination, when you have a word, there's always provision for the vision. It didn't happen by me sitting down in my house praying for it. I had to get up and go. I had to do something. The Bible says that God will bless the works of your hands. So God didn't bless me because I prayed. God blessed me because I believed what he told me to do. And then I put my hands to work. The next table, $20. The next table, $50. I went back to work the next day. Somebody gave me a $200 tip. For what? I was selling hamburgers like there's no money in that it wasn't a high-end restaurant it was one of those you know god bless where i worked <laughs> one of the cleaners in my dad's church now is still uh, he was one of the guys that used to flip the burgers in the restaurant i used to work in and uh, we, he still goes back remember when we used to work in the charcoal pit together and i'm like yeah <laughs> thank you jesus for moving me forward <laughs> But um, by that Sunday, I didn't just have $1,000 to give. I had $1,000 to give towards the roof, and I had the tithe to give on top of it. Because that's how God works. Do you hear what I'm saying? When God speaks to you in a big way, He does big things through your life. There was another time in my life that God spoke to me in a very big way. And it's a story that many of you might be familiar with, where my husband and I couldn't have children. We went through many years of infertility and our first son was born out of IVF. We did six total IVFs. Our first son was an IVF baby. After he was born full term, he died. And there was a time right after he died, within, within an hour of his death, I was sitting in the hospital room and I was holding my dead baby. And I was looking at my dead baby, I was crying, I mean, big tears. But I heard the voice of the Lord. And he said, Laurie, you are a mother, not you're going to be a mother. He said, Laurie, you are a mother. And I held that word in my heart. And I came back to Nigeria after that traumatic loss. And everyone's supposed to be saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. In my mind, I was, I just, anybody who told me sorry, I was like, sorry, I'm not accepting sorry because I'm a mom. And they might've said, oh, she's deceived. I had people who said that I never had a baby because I delivered abroad, so they never saw the pregnancy. I had people that said all kinds of things. There was one particular prophet who came to us, my husband and I, and I'm sharing this for a reason. There was a prophet who came to us, actually he was preaching at one of our conventions, and he kept preaching and he was like, 
when I pray for people, they get twins, they get triplets, and everything was me, 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 me. I have the anointing. I am the man of God. You need me to pray for you. And it just did not bear witness with my spirit. Because I kept thinking, God, if you're going to give the Idahosa family an heir, this guy is not going to take credit for it. And so <laughs> I was listening to him, and I just did not, mm -mm, I just sat there, and if you could have seen my face in the hall, I was probably like, and everybody said, they're like, oh, you know, Laurie and Feb, you guys got to have him pray for you. And my husband said, lie, lie, this guy will not touch us. And I'm like, he won't. Then we had some elders who we very much respect tell us, go and see him. So out of obedience, we went. But we already had our agreement that this guy, he's not going to put his hands any near, anywhere near us. We don't know how we're going to do it. We don't know how we're going to manage to escape the kneel down and pray but we're going to escape it somehow. And so we agreed before we went there to see him. And we went to see him and we sat down. And before he could say anything, he started squeezing his face. And he said, hmm, son and daughter, there's sin in your life. He said, he said God cannot give you a child until you remove all that sin. When God sees you, all he sees is the dirty sin in your life. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus, because I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I know that I'm washed white as snow. I know that when God looks at me, he doesn't count my sins. My sins have been cast into the sea of forgetfulness. So that alone was like, oh, what? And so he said, um, he said, I need you to do a dry fast for 30 days. And he said, when you're done with this dry fast, he now gave me his phone number. He wouldn't give it to my husband. He gave it to me. I don't know why he gave me his number. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus, for some of our pastors. Thank you, Lord. But uh, he gives me his number. And he's like, when you're done with your dry fast, I want you to call me and I want you to come and see me. Not my husband, me. Because I want you to come and see me wherever I am in the world preaching. And God's going to give you your child. I don't know what he wanted to do with me when I was done with my 30-day fast. But it didn't bear witness with our spirit, so he said he would not pray for us. And we left there saying, thank you, Jesus. And I talked to my husband the next morning, and I said, honey, you know, since I delivered, I never got a period. I wonder if I'm pregnant. And he was like, I don't know. It was like three or so months after we had delivered, and I had a CS. So he's like, I don't know how long it takes, you know, for all those things to happen. And I was like, I'm just going to do a pregnancy test. And I had loads of them in the drawer because we've been trying to have babies for years. Like every month, like a day before it was due, I was already taking a pregnancy test. So I grabbed one of my 15 hour pregnancy tests out of the drawer and I took it and I found out that I was already pregnant. Naturally, with no doctor, no injection. When you have a word from God, no man can take the glory. When you have a word from God, there's no assignment of the enemy to steal God's glory that will have the authority to stand before you. I was already pregnant. I carried that baby to full term. Now he's a handsome 14-year-old boy. And his name is Faith Emmanuel Benson Idahosa. Because finally, you know, I'm the only uh, wife of the biological son of Idahosa. So... If I don't give a Bentonita Osa, there's Wahala. So <laughs> my first child is Faith Emmanuel Bentonita Osa. Later, God blessed us with another natural pregnancy because he told me, Laurie, you're a mother. So I could hold on to that word. I got pregnant again naturally. That child is now 11 years old. His name is Nathaniel Victor Bentonita Osa. <laughs> and then while I was still breastfeeding, Nathaniel, when you're supposed to be, you know, doing baby friendly, you can't get pregnant, blah, 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 blah. Nathaniel started rejecting my breast milk. I'm like, what's going on? A friend said, well, maybe you're pregnant. I said, how? <laughs> I did a test and there was Judah Victor Benson Idahosa, who just turned three years, or just turned 10 years old two days ago. And God bless us with three heirs to the Idahosa family. When God speaks a word, he doesn't withhold anything. 
It doesn't come without fear. Fear will be there. We've all heard it said that fear, do not be afraid, is mentioned 365 times in the Bible. One for each day. Because some of us tend to be afraid. What did the angel tell Mary? Don't be afraid. What is God speaking to you right now as you're looking into the promise that he has for your future? That word that he's spoken over you in a big way. He's saying to you, do not be afraid. I had to come back to Nigeria after losing my son and I was broken. Emotionally broken. But I was spiritually strengthened because I had a word. And nothing, nothing that anybody could say to me could shake that word that I had on the inside of me. I want to speak to some of us that are in this room that have a word from God that's not yet manifested. That we haven't even started walking in the direction of what God has spoken because it looks foreign to us. It looks scary. It looks like it might be embarrassing. I want to speak to you right now that you should not be afraid. That you can say unto the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Now I want to remind us that God speaks to us about both the spiritual and the non-spiritual things. Because even the things that seem to be non-spiritual line up with the spiritual. And they, they work into the trajectory of the future and the destiny that God has for us. So if God's speaking to you something that is relatively non-spiritual, such as study law instead of medicine, or he's speaking to you something that seems non-spiritual, like, mm -mm, don't move into that complex. Don't stay in that house. Don't be friends with that person. Don't date that guy. You might say, why is God involved in my dating life? Because he has a destiny for your future. And he knows that one mess up in that area could destroy you for life. He might give you somebody like my mom who helps break up your relationships. <laughs> who do you share your dreams with? Who do you share your vision with? Who do you have that you can link arms with like Mary had Elizabeth? And when she had the word from God, she had a partner that she could stand with and say, this is what God's doing. And Elizabeth is like, oh, the baby's leaping in my belly because this is what God's doing in me too. Your connections are very important in 2023. Who you're connected to can either birth your miracle or abort your miracle. So we have to guard and guide our connections and make sure that they're in alignment with the direction of God. I want us to stand on our feet all over this room and just lift two hands to the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to us in a mighty way this morning. It's like the sound of many waters. <laughs> it's washing away every uncertainty, every doubt, every confusion. I want, us to, I want you first just to ask the Lord to help you be rooted and grounded in his word. To help you have the mind of Christ, to put on Christ. To think thoughts that are holy, that are righteous, that are pure. To lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset you so that you can run the race that is set before you. I want you to tell the Lord right now, like it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, say, I will not be anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, I'm letting my requests be made known unto God. I want you right now to push down that anxiety and say the peace of God that surpasses all of my natural understanding. It will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Some of you right now, God is speaking to you to cut off business relationships. The Lord just spoke to me that there's some of you that are involved in unholy businesses. And God is speaking to you right now to cut off that source of income so he can show you that he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. I want you to ask God right now for the peace, the strength, and the courage that it takes to make that decision. To walk in faith concerning your finances. 
some of us, God is speaking to us in a very big way right now. And he's giving us a divine direction for the ministry that he's called us into. Some of us, it's business ideas that he's pouring into your spirit right now. Inventions, witty inventions, creative ideas. The spirit of the Lord is in this house right now, speaking to his people supernaturally. I want you to hear from him and say, Father, be it unto me according to your word. I want you to vocalize your choice to obey. Vocalize it. Tell him, say, Father, I will obey. Father, I will go the direction you've called me to do. Father, I will hear your voice. The voice of a stranger I will no longer follow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you that from today forward, we hear from you. We hear from you. We hear from you. Today when I hear from you. That it'll be our daily experience. And then the areas where we need to have a supernatural big word. We receive it from you. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Dearly beloved. We believe you've been greatly blessed by this sermon. Visit spiritnerds.org to download more MP3 sermons of your favorite preachers. Reach us by email for more information and concerns at spiritnerds.org at gmail.com.